Well, as I said, another one that we've heard from a lot of people over the last couple days, maybe three days, is reportedly Jim Crockett Jr. is, as I read before, in grave condition right now in a hospital. And a lot of people wanted to hear your thoughts on someone who you worked for, someone who made you a lot of money, Jim Crockett Jr. Yeah. Well, and this is another thing that just came up all of a sudden, right? I hadn't heard that he was in, in bad health. I, you know, uh, he, uh, you know, is 70, I guess, 76 years old or something like that. But uh, suddenly, boom, he's in the hospital. Oh, my gosh. And, and you know, things are not good. So, you know, I, I, I got to admit in the past uh, on, uh, for a while being mad at Jimmy Crockett, not mad like I'm going to cuss you or whatever, just like, God dang it disappointed i guess because it the the way the whole transition turned out between crockett promotions and and turner broadcasting um at first i de we all definitely were mad at him in 1988 for the 40 cents on the dollar on what he owed us on the contracts that we'd signed and that wasn't limited to me and midnight express but it was a number of people but then with the passage of time I re you know, I, I realize that some people didn't get anything, if not, I, I don't think any of the wrestlers, but some of the other uh, people that they, the company owed money to, but uh, his attorney, who uh, Dennis Guthrie, was Crockett's attorney in that period of time, and he had called us and a few other people and said, look, um, we've got a limited amount of money to work with. We're calling you guys first. We got enough to pay you 40 cents on the dollar and, you know, take care of the people he wants to take care of or elsewise you can sue us and probably not get anything. So that was kind of an easy decision to make, but I was, you know, not happy for a while, but in hindsight, not only did he at least come through with 40 cents on the dollar, but TBS had to start paying us on the contracts he signed. So we made a lot of money from them. And I get the disappointment came from just it. at first we've mentioned this. When we went into the deep dives. We were all excited about TBS owning the promotion because we thought it'll still be, you know, the, the wrestling side will continue to be what it has been. And we'll have the money to expand and et cetera, and do these things right instead of half ass. And it turned out they destroyed the wrestling side. And so at the, by 89, 90, uh, me and some of the guys were like, fuck Jimmy, if you'd have done this or that or the other thing. But then with the passage of time and me doing my own thing, promoting and realizing Crockett promotions never wanted to expand nationwide and they should, they shouldn't have, and they didn't want to, and they did it only really out of getting caught up in two things. With Vince expanding and taking talent, you had to compete for talent. You had to compete for television time and television outlets. But Crockett knew that they were, Jim Crockett especially, knew they were strongest. And this is what their goal always was to be mid Atlantic wrestling, to promote in the Carolinas and Virginia, to live comfortable, very comfortable lives that they all lived and had the money they needed to have and regional, you know, fame as far as Crockett promotions. And he's the wrestling promoter. And that was the biggest professional sport in the Carolinas for 40 fucking years besides NASCAR. Um, when the, the the two things happened were one Vince starting to expand and them having to compete with for talent and for TV outlets and et cetera. But secondly, the business got so hot, it got impossible not to get caught up in it. When you can go to Philadelphia and sell out to Baltimore or sell out to and sell out to Baltimore Civics, that'd be a real trick. That is really impressive. That's really impressive. <laughs> When you can go to Philly and sell out to Philly Civic Center, go to Baltimore and sell out to Baltimore, uh, now Arena, then the Civic Center, 12, 13,000 people. Or you can go, you know, some of the various places that they could go and did and did in Chicago and do sellouts seven months in a row in a 10,000 seat building. <clears throat> it was hard to turn down that kind of money. But then it's like being a little bit pregnant. 
and uh, people kept telling him, "We oh, we've got to keep up with Vince, and we got a, a new market, so we got to go out to the West Coast." We had no business doing that, and so anyway, I guess the point is, I realized that he had people talking him into it, and it was easy to get caught up in it when you when you could go to those places and and do that kind of business. But then it was all over the map, and for every Chicago, there was a, a fucking Peoria. Or for every, you know, Philadelphia, there was also when they'd try to go to goddamn, for whatever reason, West Palm Beach two weeks in a row or some shit. And it just, so anyway, um, you've got to say this about Jimmy Crockett. He ran for, what was it, 50, almost 15 years, the only... United States promotion that got big enough to compete with Vince McMahon on a level playing field as far as far as the TV ratings and the house show gates. Um, as we mentioned before, it was just Vince put together so much of a an office infrastructure and marketing and merchandising and the business people and being based out of New York. And Vince always wanted to be Walt Disney of wrestling and take over the world. Jimmy Crockett didn't. As I said, they would have been as happy as clams, and I would have too, if they had continued to promote Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling in, in North Carolina, South Carolina, Virginia, and West Virginia, and parts of Georgia. They, could, they would have been happy to do that for the next 30 years, and I would have been happy to stay there and work for them. Can I ask you a question or a couple yes. of questions? We all have done the what if, what if Bill Watts gets the TBS time slot, which was where things were going. He was going to be a partner with Ted Turner and have the TV time. And then Jim Barnett brokered a deal to have Vince McMahon sell Jim Crockett Jr. The 605 show for a million dollars. And that was it. All of a sudden, Turner didn't want to do the deal with Watts. And that was the end of Mid-South Wrestling, the highest rated show on cable television being on TBS. And a lot of people have always said, what if, what if Bill Watts had gotten that national time slot and he had been competing against Vince McMahon? But I want to ask it a different way. What if Bill Watts had gotten that time slot? What do you think the next few years of Mid-Atlantic Wrestling would have been like? And also, do you think things would have been as hot in 86 just based on local TV without the national cable outlet? Uh, boy. Bill Watts would not... Here's the thing. Bill Watts's wrestling show would have done even better ratings than Crockett having the slot because Watts would have done, he wouldn't have done a, a, the, the, the formula that Dusty did, which was more of the, you know, squash matches and promos. Watts would have been juicing it up every week. The problem still was that Watts would have died probably quicker trying to tour live events nationally because he didn't have a, as big of or as experienced of an office staff as Crockett did. Now, when you say that, just to jump in real quick, Vince McMahon had an office in Connecticut, had people from outside wrestling that he was hiring left and right. He had a full office, which would only grow. So people understand what was the office structure of Jim Crockett Promotions and Mid-South Sports, how many people were actually working in their offices. Oh, well, let's, let me do this by memory. Um, because if you walked into the office of Jim Crockett Promotions on Briar Bend Drive in Charlotte on any given Wednesday when we were doing promos uh, for the local, you know, broadcast uh, outlets, the, the wrestlers, there would be 16 of us between Gene Anderson running it and the wrestlers and Jackie Crockett running the camera and the guys doing promos. And we outnumbered the entire Jim Crockett promotions office staff by at least twice. There was three secretaries in the front corner. There was Sandy Scott. There was, uh, Dave Johnson, the accountant, uh, Jimmy Crockett in his office, dusty in the corner of it next to it. Um, Leonard, the guy that did the overnight dubs and cleaned up Klondike Bill, um, did not only 
at first they had him doing uh, the rings and maintenance and working out at the ballpark. But when the ballpark went away, then it, he just came in and George Harris for a while till he retired. That was, I, I mean, besides for local promoters like the Mernix that lived up in, in, uh, uh, I guess they were in Raleigh, um, or, you know, the, the local people in the different towns that ran shows at the buildings there, that was the entire office staff. And then they started making deals with people for free. That, that was the problem. They didn't, they didn't have a giant office building. It was a converted convenience store. Vince got Titan Tower, right? What the fuck? There's all these floors, all these offices, all these people. Crockett was hiring people in different places as freelancers and whether they were good, bad, or indifferent, you know, got like Rob Garner to help with syndication or whatever, but it wasn't a giant operation. <clears throat> I was never at Bill Watts's office because I think he had one for a while, but it may have been in his house. That's what I was thinking too. It was in his house. Um, you know, I mean, I think they had an office address, you know, for a period of time, uh, or maybe just a post office box. And I think McGurk had had an office in Tulsa somewhere in the seventies, but Bill Watts, office was in his house for most of that time. And I mean, I wasn't even there when toward the end of mid South or the end of universal wrestling federation, they started shooting TVs out of Oklahoma and having guys over to shoot promos and stuff. but. We did all the TVs in Shreveport at that period of time. So I'd, there was not really a Mid-South office. He had a secretary, and she did a lot of phone work and and uh, paperwork, but that was it. And that and that's what I'm saying, and that's another reason. Wrestling was meant to be territorial and meant to be regional, and these guys were the best at it. And... Uh, before you say, well, what a nickel and dime operation, Jim Crockett promotions running an operation like that, that I just described grossed $20 million in 1986. What is that? 50 something today. Watts is a fucking uh, operation in 1984 that I just described where, you know, he's got an office in his fucking house in Oklahoma that nobody ever sees and a secretary. And then everything else is pretty much done on the road by Grizzly Smith, Jim Ross, whatever the fuck, a few local promoters. Um, what was his best? It, well, his best year was 84, but what was that gross? Was it like $8 million or something like that? I forget the number, but it was certainly his best year, 84. Because in uh, during the period of time that the last Stampede matches was going on, it was a five-week period. We did a little bit over a million dollars in houses. And that was just in five weeks that year. So... The point is, and 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 it worked. That's the way wrestling needed to be done, and that's why. And the Crockett's were happy doing it. And the the family business. That's the only wrestling promotion. <clears throat> Think about this now. When Jim Crockett Senior started the company in 1933, and because Crockett Senior had been uh, dabbled in wrestling in the Tri Cities in Bristol, Virginia, and Kingsport, Tennessee, he worked. He was a salesman for a guy that owned a big appliance dealership there and furniture store, whatever, and and it dabbled in wrestling promotion. And he had, and then he moved to Charlotte and started his own promotion. And then he died. What forty years later in seventy three, Crockett sold the the company to TBS in eighty eight. So that in fifty five years, that's the only major wrestling territory in the United States that was under the same ownership with no changes, no outside owners. None of the boys ever got a chance to buy in. It was a Crockett family promotion. And, and I think what in the world only what the CMLL or whatever their original name was in Mexico would beat that, that run. You're the expert. Help me. In terms of a family-owned business without any outside investors for that length of time, probably CMLL, EMLL, whatever you want to call it. And it, I mean, there were other family-owned promotions, but just not for that length of time. The uh, yes, e Eatons and LaBelle's in Los Angeles, just not for that length of time or that success after a sure. while. Sure, and 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 it uh, Don most, Owen. 
Dono and and most territories also at one point or another, you know, one of the boys was able to to buy in or when the territories really were formed, it was one of the guys had been such a big star on network television that they went back home and they had to, you know, they had the stroke to get in Vern Gagne, Dick the Bruiser, Eddie Graham, whoever the but Jim Crockett Sr. ran that place and he didn't overreach. That was the big after his death, when uh, John Ringley and then Jimmy Jr. took over, that was the big upgrade of the Carolinas from the, you know, the regular, consistent tag team territory, local guys kind of business that they had done for all those years, 40 years, to bringing in the best talent and upgrading and, and George Scott and Wahoo and Valentine and Flair and et cetera. Um, But Crockett Sr. was content with running his business over the long term successfully. And I think that's what Jimmy Jr. would have wanted to do if it just if it hadn't got so hot. Because the the Carolinas for years, besides Greensboro, when they built the Coliseum, they started going into that in the early 60s with the holiday spectaculars and everything. But most of the towns in the Carolinas, they ran in Virginia, they ran weekly in the smaller buildings and or predating when they built the bigger buildings. But they were still running the park center in Charlotte that seated like 3,000 into the early 70s, but they'd run them every week. And the the top guys, George Becker and Johnny Weaver. George Becker didn't even work a different territory after he went to the Carolinas from the, from the mid fifties on nobody in the rest of the country knew who the fuck George Becker was, but he was a household name in the Carolinas, Johnny Weaver. He stayed there for 25 years and he was the big, you know, in the, in the sixties and early seventies, the big fucking baby face. But if he couldn't get arrested anywhere else in the country, but that's because when the guy's, got over there, they they stayed, and people remembered them. And then, uh, we've told a story before, but when Jim Sr. passed away, John Ringley, who was his son-in-law, who was Francis's husband, had already been involved in the, in the office and in a promotion, and he was going to be the one to run it. And he's the one that made the call to bring George Scott in as Booker and change the the dynamic of the territory to bring in bigger national names and run bigger buildings and expand. And not just tag teams. It was a tag and not team just, territory. Not just tag teams because it was a tag team territory, but based on the singles title, which was, that's what Valentine was the key for. But that was a shift of of style. And it was kind of a risk because, you know, you don't, you it, when you've got a successful territory, you don't normally want to re-educate your fans to what you're doing. It's only when things are the shits and you're grasping at straws, but then sometimes it's too late. But what they did was they took a a regional promotion that was already making good, solid, steady money and changed the way that it was presented, upgraded everything, changed the talent. You know, when, when Ron Fuller did that in Knoxville, he started bringing in some of the top names in the NWA and some of the best talent in Southern wrestling, but because it was different, they had the Wright brothers, Ron and Don Wright and Whitey Caldwell and Don Carson. And you know, those guys that were known in East Tennessee had been drawing 6,000 people outdoors at Shell Howie park in 1973. And Ron went through a period of time for several months where he couldn't draw half that at the Coliseum. And it was a similar thing. He was trying to re-educate those fans because yeah. one of the first things he did was bring in wrestlers. He was so influenced by Eddie Graham's style of wrestling, he brought in Danny Hodge. He brought in Dale Lewis, a very different type of wrestler than you would normally yeah. see in Eastern Tennessee. And and that was the thing with the tag team matches and six mans, the Assassins and Kentuckians, and well, the Assassins were the Bolos in the Carolinas, uh, and the Kentuckians, and Nelson Royal and Sandy Scott and Tex, blah, blah, blah. They were more action, but at the same time, they weren't always the great technical workers. They was more Southern style. And that's why when Valentine came in, the first thing he did was sit down and bore him out for a while uh, because they, they, it was a re-education process. Anyway, problem was before too long, um, 
Ringley and Francis Crockett had a falling out over a falling in that he had with another woman. And that's wasn't it. Am I wrong? It was a stewardess on the on the plane. Well, it, it, don't say on the plane. Uh, on a plane, they didn't have an. They didn't have the plane. plane yet. Then. Okay, they didn't have a plane then. But there it was a it was a stewardess. I I think something like that. One of the one of the because uh, they still even in those days, the top guys would charter planes or small private planes to get over the mountains and take them to the towns and get home because the schedule was crazy. Because in 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 the in the mid seventies. Mid-Atlantic wrestling only ran in North Carolina, South Carolina, and not even all parts of Virginia, just most of Virginia. But they would run up to three live events every night of the week because they were so wrestling crazy and they had a huge fucking talent roster to where sometimes you'd be in the same territory with the guy and not see him for three or four weeks. He'd be up in the Virginia end, you'd be down south in South Carolina. Anyway... So Jimmy Jimmy Jr. took it over from that point, and they continued the expansion. And, you know, he did a lot of good things uh, without trying to be crazy. Like I said, Vince always wanted to take over the world. That was always his dream from day one. You can tell, and he, he started talking about it early. Jimmy Crockett, yes, he started going to arenas instead of doing studio TV. He was one of the first uh, promoters to do that, but... He, he still he bought he bought the Nemo truck, National Electronics Mobile Operation. He bought the Nemo truck from what I was told used, and it was a a TV truck that was good for the time, and got the job done. But if it had been Vince, Vince would have been wanting to buy you know the goddamn state of the art shit and and et cetera et cetera, and it paid off in the end. But you know they had a they had a TV truck, they had this giant you know, a uh, uh, apparatus set up at the office in Briar Bend in the back room to where all the dubbing machines where they did all their tape dubbing. Because what we would do when we went in on Wednesdays to do the local promos, like we, if you had TV in Pittsburgh, you had two three-minute spots. That's the local promos that the people tweet all the time these days with the Chiron down below saying, Greensboro, this Saturday night, right? Well, what they had done is after they took the TV truck to fuck Sumter, South Carolina or Spartanburg or Gaffney or Meisenheimer, North Carolina or somewhere on a Tuesday night within 60 miles of Charlotte at a high school or a college gym, it would be sold out often in advance, 1,500, 2,000 people. And that was their chance to see live wrestling in their town. And we would tape two hours of television, the syndicated TV, for the following weekend. And it would be NWA uh, NWA Pro and then Worldwide Wrestling, right? The A and B shows. And then they would immediately drive the truck back. And and Crockett had his own TV crew who weren't, weren't really all TV people, but kind of, sort of. Because, you know, Wayne Daniel was one of the producer, director guys, but like Doug Dillinger, who was a Charlotte City police officer, was one of the camera guys because he was big enough to hold that camera for two fucking hours. That's the background he had in television. And then he ended up being the security guy in WCW. But it was at least it was the same people on the TV crew all the time, and they knew what they were doing. When we were done at We'd ring the bell at 7.30, first show from 7.45 to 8.45, take a 15-minute break, second show from 9 to 10, and a fucking um, uh, dark match at the end. They'd drive the truck back to Charlotte and start doing the overnight dubs in the office. That's where Leonard came in. Leonard was also the guy that called me to tell me they'd thrown a bunch of fucking uh, posters and film away when TBS cleared the office out. He or that Leonard. And then we'd go in on Wednesday morning, me and the Horseman and Dusty and Magnum and whoever the top guys were, the Road Warriors, Ellering, Paul Jones, the managers, whatever, JJ. And they would cue those goddamn tapes up that they had rolled all night making dubs of on all these machines. And we would put the fucking promo for Pittsburgh into the spot that it went in the tape. Live. We'd roll it in live. That's why they frowned on busted takes. 
And that's why everybody got good at doing it the first time around regardless, right? And when they finished, they'd put the label on the fucking tape and Klondike Bill or somebody would run them over to the bus station later on and put them on a bus to Pittsburgh or wherever the TV station was. That's how TV fucking tapes got delivered in those days and the promos put in. We were talking about Jimmy Crockett, though. Yeah, and, and I want to go back to my two questions I asked you, but just one Did I answer of, either one of them? Not one of them. <laughs> but I did want to also point out, you mentioned how Jim Crockett Sr. really didn't do anything outside of his towns and his territory, with one notable exception, which I've always been fascinated with, where with Antonina Rocca as his top star, he tried to compete against Vince McMahon in New York. Yes. Which is fascinating to me, just the idea that he... He would try that from the Carolinas to try to come into New York and do that. Well, and I don't know the the circumstances, and I didn't even know that this happened. Like, you know, so many of these things have been lost to history. That's why over the last 20 years, I'm glad, glad we've had so many historians dig these things up. When I worked the Carolinas, I didn't know that that happened, or I would have asked Jimmy Crockett uh, if, what he knew about it. But apparently when... Rocca was fading in New York. Vince Sr. replaced him with Bruno. There was obviously a falling out. One can suppose that Rocca's, Rocca wasn't ready to go just yet, go quietly. And, and he had a pretty healthy ego, probably still thought he was, you know, should be the top guy. But within, what, weeks after Rocca finishes and Bruno wins the title in New York, Rock Argentina Rocca, the biggest gate attraction, one of the biggest gate attractions of the previous 10 years is main eventing in the Carolinas. Just out, just that's really the only other territory he ever worked on a regular basis after going to New York in 19 fucking 50. Right. And at that same time, for a brief period of time, some of the guys that were wrestling in the Carolinas uh, they, they started running against Vince in, in what, was it just the New York market or was it because it, it, back in those days, the interstates were new, but if you hop on 95, you go through Washington, Baltimore, Philly, and finally get to New York and 95 runs right down into the Carolinas. Were they just going up the Eastern seaboard or was it New York centric? I'm not exactly sure, but it is worth noting here that Vince senior's office he was centered out of Washington, D.C. still, not New York. Well, that's true. Uh, but they were running the opposition shows in New York, correct? Yes. Yes. So so both those things are true. But when they had to go, I bet they gave Vince a Vince Sr. of the fucking finger when they drove through Washington on the way to fucking New York. But anyway, they didn't last long, and that wasn't going to work anyway. Um, and maybe did that set some ill will in motion in 1964 for 20 something years later on when Vince jr. Took over and got the chance to fuck Jim senior's son. I don't One know. Wonders. I don't know for sure, but Vince senior Vince jr. Excuse me. Certainly seemed to take great delight in fucking with Jim Crockett jr. There are certain guys that Vince jr. Respected and didn't really want to fuck with, but he still wanted their territory like Bill Watts. <laughs> Yeah, And then there are people like Vern and Jim Crockett Jr. that it seemed to be somewhat personal from Vince Jr. But to go back to my two questions. What were they? It's been so long. If Watts gets the TBS time slot, what happens to Mid-Atlantic Wrestling the next several years? Oh, also, okay. Well, I did is answer 86 what... as hot without the national cable television show? Well, okay, I did answer what would happen to Watts. Watts would have, didn't have the infrastructure to go national either, and it would have been expected, and he would have been caught up in it. Right, but that's the one everyone always talks about. What would have happened to Watts, but what would have happened to Jim Crockett if he well, didn't Well, yes. Yeah. Mid-Atlantic was still going to start, or still going to be doing great business in the core territory because the guys that were already there or about to be there when Crockett got the uh, the TV it, they were it was still a, an incredible collection of talent and and we didn't go me and the midnight express because they got the tbs slot it, it, we were already we already wanted to go before they got it um and we had already started calling when they actually did get it 
Uh, we've told that story before, but it, it the, that was the icing on the cake that we were on TBS too. But they had an incredible uh, TV lineup, every major market in the Southeast and a bunch of them across the country uh, that were beginning to blossom. So Mid-Atlantic would have done well, but it wouldn't have been, I don't think 86 overall would have been as hot. Although maybe with, with the best wrestling program in the world on TBS and that incredible talent roster in the Carolinas and that syndicated TV and, you know, everything that Vince was doing, it may still have been hot, but hot in different ways. Yeah. And that talent roster was the mid South talent roster of 1984 midnight express yeah. rock and roll Magnum, buddy Landell, Terry Taylor. Well, but Russia no, Khrushchev, but, but also, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but with the Road Warriors and with That's Dusty true. Rhodes yeah. and with uh, uh, Barry Flair Wendell and with Ric Flair yeah. and, you know, so, yeah, it w it was just, it was, and that's, like I said, getting back to, to Jimmy, that's what got him, unfortunately, caught up in the big expansion, something that had never been their goal and that they just felt like they were kind of doing in self-defense. And, you know, I think that's what hastened the downfall more than anything else is expanding so far. If they hadn't, have, I, and I, I agree with the, the purchase of the UWF was not pie in the sky. They had amazing television coverage and they did have some, some value, but buying Kansas city, cause you feel bad for them and buying Florida because you feel bad. I don't know how much it was, but just, they they absorbed too much too quick. And trying to to still do Kansas City TV tapings and and sending a crew to Kansas City and doing the same thing in Florida. If if they had just, you know, I can understand acquiring the UWF, like I said, with their with their television outlets and just the name and the talent contracts, the goodwill, whatever. But the other territories, they were being too nice. And, you know, when Vince did fucking offer to buy a territory from anybody, generally he didn't pay them in the end. So what the fuck? But I think that's that was the problem. If if Crockett had not done that and not bought the information that he had been told that the television ad revenue is going to be the wave of the future. And if you have all these TVs, you're going to get all this ad revenue, but then they never found anybody to sell it right. And it didn't come to pass. And well, he was also told Vince McMahon's going to buy this. If you don't, which may not have been true. Well, yeah. And then he and, jumped in. I think it was Jim Ross who told them that actually. Um, well, I'm just talking about the, the television ad revenue in general, the people that they had selling it and the, the, the concept was somewhat valid, but in execution, it never worked. And and then, of course, he moved his office to Dallas. Well, and that's another thing, because at that point, I don't know how much ribbon on the square this was, but it was like they a lot of the guys were saying that Jimmy moved to Dallas to get away from David and Jackie and Francis because they didn't want him to sell it or they didn't want to expand like this. And, yeah, the, the Dallas office was... That's the, and, and the, but he was told, oh, you can't be in Charlotte. You have to be in a big media center like Dallas and look at these beautiful offices we have down here already that we can take clients to. Fuck you. What clients? That was the point when they started trying to be something they weren't and they started making less money than when they were running a fucking if, if money making hand over fist business out of a converted convenience store in fucking Charlotte, they tried to get big and national. If they'd have stuck with the converted convenience store and just doing what they were doing without buying the other territories and trying to chase Vince nationwide, they, they would have been in business for several more years in the Carolinas, uh, several more years, because instead of, suddenly finding out they were a couple million dollars in the hole and not wanting to risk their mother's retirement funds and not wanting to at that stage of the game start borrowing money or finding investors to do all this thing they just said fuck it we're just going to sell it um but they they would if they'd stayed in business without 
being $2 million in the hole from the purchases of those territories and the expansion, they wouldn't have lost $2 million anywhere in the near future at that point or overnight or in a short period of time. It, the business, like all the other territories, it would have started to go down. And there would have been fits and spurts. And you could run an angle and get some back, but it might not. It was like Memphis. You know, it, it you can get 6,000 people in the Coliseum, but only once in a while instead of more than that every week. And, I mean, finally, Vince would have exposed everything. The TV, he would have done what he would have done. But Crockett would have lasted several more years in the Carolinas and in the Southeast just because, well, I mean, look at the people now that, that still support shitty promotions because they don't want to break up, right? The people in the Carolinas, the core audience, the basic wrestling fans there would have, would have been decent and probably even profitable numbers supported a non-national promotion in that part of the country for the next few years at least into the early to mid 90s and it may not have been as big as what it had been in the 80s but it, they would have still been in business and maybe not competitive for the top talent but there would they would have been the last place for anybody to go instead of memphis and smoky mountain that's what i think cuz it would they were so big in the carolinas if they had just concentrated on that and wanted to stay in the business in the wrestling business it would have taken them so long the Carolinas got killed because TBS just ran off and left them and not only presented Crockett would not have presented a shit product that TBS presented in the early nineties. Crockett would not have turned off the fans that they had in the Carolinas in the early nineties, like TBS did. I know Crockett started it with moving Starcade, but that was part of that whole expansion thing. Um, it would have taken quite a while to fucking to kill that territory, even if you were trying to, which, <laughs> which actually they, they kind of were trying to when TBS bought it and it still took what a year, year and a half to kill the Carolinas. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, Greensboro bottomed down, I think 91. So that makes sense. But a uh, question for you. Uh, and Ric Flair, by the way, has always said that he thought that, I mean, I don't know if I'd go this far, but if they hadn't tried to expand Crockett promotions, they'd be in business today. You know, which I don't know about today, but to your point, what you were just saying, certainly a few years longer than they were. Yeah. But when the purchase happened in 88, Jim Crockett Jr. signed a deal where he was going to be, I don't know what the exact role was, an executive, a consultant with Crockett, with uh, Turner Broadcasting. He was a consultant. He was going to be a consultant. Then they never consulted with him. Right. After that initial run where he was the booker before George Scott got there, which was when he hated Randy Rose. But a few years later, 93, his contract came up and there was so much talk around wrestling. What's Jim Crockett going to do? He's going to do something. And he, he partnered up with Paul Heyman, which was surprising. And that was when they were going to try to do something together. It didn't work out. It was, he was going to be involved with ECW. It was going to be the WWN, uh, I think it was. And then yes. he started the NWA again in 94, or I shouldn't say started the NWA as an NWA promoter, started promoting again using the name NWA. They did a first taping in East Tennessee in Chattanooga. And then using he, my, using my ring. You were there. You were there for that. I was, no, I was not there. My ring was there. I got a picture of you there at the monitor with Jim Crockett Jr. <laughs> what? I can show you this picture. It was in a Japanese magazine. But God damn it, I don't remember being there. He then went to Dallas and did his tapings in a sportatorium, which was just wrestling death in yeah. the early to mid nineties. Anything in a sportatorium. They had some talent that were in and out of that building, but it was not good. It was dark and it felt it. But did you think that he really was gonna make some big comeback? I'd like to say, oh yes, but actually, oh no. Um I was looking at, at what we were doing. I was looking at what everybody else in wrestling was doing. And then I was looking at Jim Crockett trying to start a new TV at that point with some of the people that he had on the TV, which was basically people from everywhere that weren't really, I mean, he had some, some of my guys, some, and, and also, and, and, 
Ricky and Robert came back and said, well, he tried to steal us away for the next taping because the following taping was we we had, you know, dates uh, in Smoky Mountain. And they said, well, we can't do that. And he, Crockett got mad because they wouldn't come and do his TVs. All the money I made y'all. He's, Ricky said, yeah, but this is actually where we're working now. That was fucking six years ago. Anyway. Um, he should have asked I for just, the fan club money. Well, where's, yeah, our, yeah. where's well, there, our fan club money? There was still some heat over that. Um, I just, I, I thought that he was doing it probably just because he felt bad the way that the previous one worked out and, and that's what he'd done or been around most of his life and he wanted to do it again. But I, I didn't see it. The, the TV he was doing with the talent he was doing and the money he was spending, I didn't see it being any more or less successful than any of the rest of us with what we were doing. Um, you know, it, it, also at that point, uh, he did the first taping in East Tennessee just because I think he got Ronnie West to help promote it for him. It, it, it actually wasn't East Tennessee. It was uh, down in, it was around Chattanooga. Yeah. Was it in Chattanooga itself? I, I think was it, it was. In I thought it was in Chattanooga, but I could be wrong. Okay. But yeah, but Chattanooga is really not East Tennessee. It's South Tennessee. Anyway. um. But then I'm like, well, what the fuck is he going to run to Chattanooga? Well, no, because he lives in Dallas and and they were just doing a TV tape in the air. As I said, I think because uh, Ronnie West was going to promote the live event portion of it. But then I'm like, well, what is your territory going to be? See, everybody thought, well, Crockett's going to do TV again. He's going to get the blah, blah, blah. What's your territory going to be? Are you trying to do national TV? In that case, then I'm going to, you know, write this off right now. If you are going to open a territory, I'm interested, but Dallas, I'm not interested because it's dead. Um, so I honestly really didn't hold out a lot of hope that this was going to be a game changing endeavor that Jimmy was in. When was the last time you saw him? The last time I, I talked to him during that period, that was the last time that I, I talked to him and I, he was running it because he. I guess for something to do, because I, you know, the Crockett still had some money, but when he moved to Dallas, he got an ice cream shop. And I was talking to him about the first taping where we were working out using the ring and et cetera, et cetera. And he said, hold on a second. I heard he said it'd be two ninety five or whatever. Ding, ding. He was running the cash register at his ice cream store. <laughs> and I'm, you know, I'm pretty sure those days, that's probably the last time that I've Talk to him. He, he, with the exception of what was it? You know, uh, one of the big Mark fests a few years ago that he made an appearance at. Um, he's he's done no appearances. You know, you'd see David every once in a while. I've seen David just a year or two ago, and Jackie saw him in in uh, Charlotte uh, when we did the uh, NWA pay per view. And Francis, but, you know, you never saw Jimmy. And he just, I guess, uh, he probably didn't want to go back over relitigating, you know, the closing days of Crockett Promotions at every fan fest in the world. Yeah, I believe he was the only one who, in the family, who didn't. Well, I shouldn't say the only one, but I think David blamed Dusty and Jim Crockett Jr. actually didn't, surprisingly. Well, that's the way he did do an interview years back where, he, you know, and I respected him for that. He said, hey, it was my fault. And he said he can't even blame Dave Johnson, the accountant, it, you know, which is true. You blame Dave Johnson for being a shitty accountant, but you can blame Jimmy Crockett for employing a shitty accountant. Um, So it was it was he did take the responsibility for the way the things went. But as I said, it. It's kind of not fair in hindsight because it wasn't what he wanted to do to begin with. It was not his goal to rule the wrestling world. He wanted, wanted to run Crockett Promotions in the Carolinas, and everybody would have been fine with that. Me too. Like I said, I'd have stayed there forever. Well, certainly we both, and I'm sure all the listeners, hope that things turn out for the best, that somehow he gets better. We've heard you know, that he's in bad condition, but you never know. And uh, certainly we all hope for the best for Jim Crockett Jr.